I like Hitman 2 quite a lot. If you've seen my videos on this Baron channel recently, you'll know that I like it so much that I made an entire series out of getting my sodding elusive target suits back, because save files are clearly too hard to port over. <clears throat> They're not. In case you're wondering, they use the exact same engine. Literally no reason why you can do that. Ten months on, on June 30th, saw the first proper content drop for Expansion Pass holders. Those are the people with the Hitman 2 Expansion Pass, the Gold Edition and the Silver Edition of the games. If you owned a standard copy of the game, well, I hope Mumbai is treating you nicely. Y you're not missing much. I thought it'd be fun to go into detail on the Expansion Pass content and give my opinion on it. The good and the bad, whether people liked it or not. Let's talk about it, and we'll start with the bank first, before we get to those reskins. Oh, oh, don't worry, we'll get to them. Yes, I'm fully aware that the first thing to release for the expansion pass was the winter sports pack, but screw it, it's my review and I'm starting on a positive note, damn it. The bank, or rather golden handshake, is rather good in pretty much every aspect. It's not perfect, but we'll get to that. The story is compelling for what it's worth. It continues straight on from the main game storyline. Alright, you have a blanket 10 seconds before I start dropping spoiler bombs for you to avert your ears. Go to this timestamp to skip to the bank map overview. Alright, you've had your chance. Here be spoilers. So, with the constant captured, he gives you the names of the three families of the partners, the backbone of Providence, essentially. You require going to the Milton Fitzpatrick Bank in New York to acquire data from a data server stored in the vault. This comes in two forms, either you collect three partial data disk backups from Fabian Mann and Mateo Perez, as well as Athena Savales, the latter of which is your target for the mission, as she is a Providence operative, and you need all three to exit or you can go full Mission Impossible and get the data rack from the vault. It's a nice way of shaking things up so you can just acquire the data while going around the bank naturally, even if it takes a lot longer to do, rather than going to the bottom floor constantly to nab the vault's data rack. This is a response to the virus in the cave of Sapienza in the World of Tomorrow mission. Ethos Field Lab, you made it. The virus prototype will be close by. Look for some type of quarantine unit. Which the devs even side this is a reference in the IOI monthly that preceded the launch of the bank. But we wanted to make sure that we didn't repeat uh, the virus in Sapienza, where you're mm -hmm. kind of funneled uh, down to the lab yeah. every time you play. Yeah. So we tried to spice it up a little bit mm -hmm. and uh, give you an alternative uh, way of uh, fixing it. Our alternative, uh, get the data from the vault, yeah. is uh, retrieving uh, some data disks that are on uh, Athena Savalas yeah. and on uh, Perez. Yeah. yeah, you can see them on the picture now. And also Fabian Mann, mm -hmm. uh, who's like her lieutenant. He's yeah. Like you kind of wish he was a target. Okay. He's uh, okay. yeah. He's he's a real real fun guy. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I think Nick had fun writing yeah. uh, his lines. Okay. Yeah. I wasn't expecting to like this level as much as I did, with great use of the layout and the sedative mechanics. There are pools of water that sedate people if they slip on the watery patch after you remove a caution wet sign. It's as slapstick and as funny as it sounds, and not really all that useful if I'm honest, but a nice addition to the level nonetheless. I get the sneaking suspicion that an escalation will make use of those at some point. Uh, well, we'll soon see. The disguises on this level are really good and choreographed to work well in specific areas of the level. As ever, the level does have a master key disguise, one that will let you get anywhere, and that is the high security guard disguise. To be fair, that particular disguise isn't easy to get on a first, second or even third run, but it does exist and it does make traversing the map easier, obviously. Whether or not you think this is a good thing or a bad thing is up to you. I personally don't mind them, but it does ruin the challenge a little bit. The map for the first time in this semi-reboot sequel, we're still not sure what this is, we get a level that's actually based completely inside. There's no way to exit the building until you completed the mission. I'm really torn about this. I don't mind the concept, considering Hokkaido and Bangkok from Hitman 2016 were mostly inside as well, that's where most of the action was. To put this into perspective, how rare this is, the last time Hitman had a level that was truly inside was the library section in Absolution, but it feels refreshing 
to visit this sort of level again, even if the library was linear as all hell. A better example would probably be Curtains Down from Blood Money, set inside a theatre in Paris. You had to kill Del Varde, if I recall correctly. I haven't played Blood Money in a while. The layout holds up to the Swiss cheese design philosophy that IOI has practiced on all the other maps, including the one that we'll talk about later, where there are almost no redundancies or dead ends in the level. Everything is connected, even the toilets, oddly enough. It avoids the Bangkok problem of the target not leaving the top floor unless you're disguised, so that makes Silent Assassin's 2 only runs on the bank a lot easier. Thank you, IOI. In fact, the only real negative I have is the bank is a bit short for my liking. Also, IOI's level designer tried to sort of brag, I think, that the bank was the first level they've made that did not have their workforce do crunch periods. Was there any stories of uh, how you changed things or any uh, big challenges that you had or anything that you are yeah. especially happy to say, mm -hmm. you know, we did this with this level or even the, even the production as a whole, like we managed to, yes. I don't know what, that's yeah. the question. I have a few things. Is there anything else that so if I can is in your head? If I can start with the last one, yeah. we pretty much did this production with no overtime. Yeah. And I know that may not be like a we for, <laughs> for like all our players. Uh, no, but, but I mean, the, the, but we had we had like a nice we had good private lives yeah. while doing this, yeah. and yeah, so it, it was that was really nice. So yeah. we, we managed to uh, be so efficient when we were at work yeah. that we could actually do it without uh, crunching. Yeah. So that was really, really cool. Yeah. That was like a big personal accomplishment because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we'd also just shipped Hitman 2. Yeah. Like, uh, like you don't want to fatigue people completely. No, no, um, no, no. So that was really, really cool. Yeah. Uh, Look, uh, hmm. I understand you're a developer and not in charge of your work schedule, near as I know, but as sincere as you're trying to be, I am not giving you extra sympathy points for trying to get a prize for basic decency, because crunch shouldn't be practiced in the modern age of 2019. Uh, congratulations, IOI, you're less dehumanizing to your workers now. What do you want from me? I'm not giving you a pat on the back. Also, the way you said it kind of implies base game Hitman 2 in 2016 was made with crunch periods, though considering Square Enix was your publisher back in 2016, that would not surprise me. So, a uh, good job on admitting that, I guess? I'm all for speaking up about crunch, especially on a developer level, but, but don't do it opportunistically to try and win some imaginary sympathy points. It came off as a bit tacky. Good lord, that was a tangent. Right, second map, Haven Island. As of recording this, I've spent about five days on and off playing it, so I have a decent idea of what the map is like. However, I'm likely to miss stuff, and this section will be a little bit smaller than the last one, just so that you're all aware. The Maldives, Haven Island, The Last Resort, there's three titles technically, is the final DLC of the game. Or rather, the final DLC location. Story time again. Okay, spoiler warning again, time snap on screen, you know the drill. Three, two, one, and here be spoilers me hearty. Olivia, the hacker that Mr. Grey has been working with, has found bank statements from the partners, with money going towards a business called Haven, operating outside of an island in the Maldives. They specialise in a more advanced version of PR, and creating new identities for wealthy individuals is the very short answer. Olivia needs access to their servers, again because the data is encrypted and every time she tries, the server resets their passwords every 10 hours. 47, again, going under the guise of Tobias Reaper, thief of diamonds from the 90s, books an appointment with Haven to eliminate Haven's head operators, Judmila Vetrova, Stephen Bradley and Tyson Williams. Killing them will give Olivia enough time to grab their server data to find out the partner's names before the servers reset. Convoluted as that briefing is, the map is anything but. The map itself is well laid out, with map sign posters around the level to let you know where you are. There are also similar arrow signs to make navigating between the bar, the pool, the restaurant and the training area easier. And much like the bank, it's a fairly small map. It's bigger than the bank, but it's not huge. I'd say it's a bit bigger than Bangkok, if I were to guess, uh, in terms of actual playable area. This is also the first map where you can go in the water, though only some parts, such as this swimming pool or the outer edges of the island. Basically, if it looks green, then you can go in it. You can't swim or anything outside of a easter egg exit, so the purpose seems to be you're having another way of navigating the island, as well as to set up a jet ski kill with Mr. Bro Hacker Bradley. Now, you'd think the game breaker would be one of the disguises, in case the bodyguard disguise, which is only in the private villa for Tyson, which is allowed everywhere except the women's 
toilets in the restaurant. Bit of an odd oversight, but okay. But no, that disguise is fairly hard to get to normally, even when you're intentionally trying to get it, without doing a mission story and KOing a butler. No, the game breaker is the stealth grass, but since we're in the tropics, stealth plants uh, are totally different. Anyway, because of the prevalence of the plants, you can legitimately get past guards by just hiding in the plentiful plant bushes that are around the place. Which I don't mind, it's a good use of them, so. Swings and roundabouts, I guess. Speaking of guards, the sight cones for them has increased in this level and in this level only. The IOI Monthly has the level designer explained that there are parts of the island that make no sense in terms of that game mechanic. If you don't know how sight cone works, that's basically the visible radius of what a guard can see, or any NPC really. So, if you're carrying an illegal weapon and a guard is looking right at you, it'll see you from further away, for, for example. I don't mind this change, it does make a lot of sense now that I've seen and played the level. I was a bit sceptical when they uh, brought this up, but I do understand. There's also a nice sniper tower, copy pasted from the Vector from the Patient Zero campaign, which is dead centre of the map. It's a nice addition, but sniper rifles are still useless as they break silent assassin when you shoot someone with it, unless you set up an accident kill in advance. So there's literally no reason to use it. Please make sniping more viable, IOI. If you kill two of the targets, a storm starts to brew. Uh, that's any two targets, there's no specific order. Which is a nice touch, but the level NPCs don't really react to it. I'm not sure why. It could have made the all non-important NPCs go back to their huts. Certain portions of the map could have been closed off unless you wore a certain disguise. Really, it's a wasted opportunity that only makes the trees sway a bit and removes the music near as I can tell, and it just brings down the mood to more serious levels. And I'm all for the sudden shift in tone, it does its job well, but the storm is simply a backdrop, not an active part of the level that threatens your mission, which is a damn shame. The Marrakesh crowd that outside of the consulate, that comes to mind. It's there for backdrop, it's not there to actually help you. The map feels quite safe in that way. It doesn't try anything new aside from the technical achievements like letting you get ankle deep into water and the aforementioned storm. So, overall, on the tier list of how good the maps are in Hitman 2 in 2016, I'm putting the bank at B tier and the resort at C tier. The bank is higher because it's something different and again, we don't get fully inside levels that often, so the change of pace is nice. Plus, it's the tighter experience of the two if I were to uh, compare the two at this time. Haven Island joins the C tier as it's pretty much a prettier Bangkok-Colorado hybrid and again, the storm concept is completely wasted. Overall, the DLC levels are totally fine. Not bad, but they're not Sapienza or Miami, and they're not big either, which, correct me if I'm wrong, was a selling point of the game. Bigger and better maps than ones seen before. The eye of the scale is bigger than any of the DLC maps, and that's one of the smallest maps in the game in terms of playable area, next to Whittleson Creek and Hawks Bay. I'm not insinuating bigger maps are always better, I'll take a smaller map with a tighter gameplay experience over a massive map with barely any content in it, which Mumbai and Columbia both avoid, which is a massive bonus. IOI certainly know how to use space properly, and you have proven you can make bigger maps. I get the feeling you couldn't because of time restraints, and you didn't want to practice crunch, which I'm, again, all for. So, if it means we get smaller maps, that is totally fine by me. Oh, and if you're wondering about missing elusive targets on the bank or the resort, I wouldn't worry, because there's a very good chance the elusive targets aren't coming to the Golden Handshake or the resort, at least not until the year is over, as the highest mastery award is a gloved variant of the starting suit for the bank. The resort has a similar sort of suit, it's a summer suit, only without the gloves. Alright, let's turn the dial to roast mode. Let's talk about the, uh, huh, the special assignments. Good lord, what a waste of resources, and I truly mean that. Alongside the bank's release, season pass holders got... Uh, special assignments for Columbia and Mumbai initially, and Miami and Whittleton Creek are on the next DLC release. Honestly, they shouldn't have bothered. I have played these levels a grand total of about 12 times. Not each, by the way, just 12 times. 16 times if you want to include grabbing footage for the video. I spent more time finding out details about the level to update Hitman Roulette, that's the Cotty web app mission randomizer thing, in case people don't know, please play it. It's really good. Cotty and me, uh, we update it on occasion, instead of, you know, 
playing it properly. The missions feel like glorified elusive targets, with the main parts of all the missions being cornered off into a portion of the map. So in Colombia, you're stalking an animal hunter in the small jungle portion of the map near the bridge, who himself is stalking a rare serpent. This is a really tiny portion of the level. It's about 5% if you want a guesstimate. In Mumbai, it's technically a larger space, but you're relegated to the chules searching for an aging hypnotist. The only interesting part of that particular mission is you need to get a guard disguise to get into the chules this time around to get anywhere close to him, which shakes things up, I guess. Those two were released during the bank's release. The last two, well, I'll say this, it has a narrative link between the two, which makes it more interesting than the other two, but that's it. A Jeep's routine in Miami is a literal triangle for crying out loud. He checks his booth, he checks the water being loaded into a truck, he checks his car. Repeat. Uh, that's not fun, nor is it interesting. The only good things about the missions in Mumbai and Colombia is that they changed the skybox's day cycle, which they didn't even bother to do on the other two, with Mumbai being set in midday and Colombia being set in either early morning or just, it's just really foggy. The only significant level edit in Colombia I could find was removing the shaman's followers and moving the shaman himself to the bar, which is the other side of the map. <sighs> took me a solid two minutes to get from the bar to his hut. There are more edits in Mumbai, notably Rangan is absent, with his tower being shut and everyone who works for him not really being there. The artist is smoking outside, perpetually getting lung cancer, and uh, yeah, that's basically it. Crunch or not, I can tell you when you're lazy with the levels, IOI. The worst part about these special assignments is not the fact that they're put together as if they were an elusive target mission, that's annoying, yes, but it's at least a 10 minute distraction from the main missions with almost no replay value. No, the part that annoys me the most is the fact that for months on end you made no effort to dissuade us from thinking they weren't bonus missions, not until the day before the first two released, that is. Bonus missions refer to the full-on reskins that change an already existing level in significant ways. These were introduced in the 2016 game. Landslide for Sapienta was one of them, and had a market near Villa Caruso, unique NPC dialogue for more than five NPCs, and a concert near the church. Salvatore Vibromo is also present, near his offices, not six miles away, and generally there's more of an effort there, as a lot of things have changed, making it feel like a new level. That is what we wanted. That's why people were excited, because people wanted to play a remix of a level that's actually quite good. Mumbai, Miami, Wutton Creek and Columbia are fantastic levels, but you didn't change much of their respective environment to justify releasing these special assignments. And guess who had to deal with these remix levels? The people who played more for your season pass. And I'm the idiot who bought the gold edition, largely because it was on sale at Christmas for 45 quid, but still, I should listen to my gut more often. Despite my own advice, I bought it to support UI or Interactive. I actually think you're a nice bunch of developers who have shown time and time again as to how to make a great sandbox level. But there's very little effort in to put into these special assignments. They perfectly encapsulate why I don't like season passes, why I don't like paying extra for getting upcoming content that we know nothing about about, because they are filler, pure and simple. As bad as replaying Legacy Elusive Targets is, making you content that barely changes the level is far, far worse in my opinion, especially when you're paying extra for it. Now on to the weapons. Now I should probably point out the only weapon I am not giving my opinion on is the Druazina 34 ICA Arctic. I'm not spending hours on end grinding it. I'm not doing that. Okay, though from what I understand, it is basically the Jager 7 to Atara, but in Arctic colours, which you can get from Haven Island, which we'll talk about in a moment. So anything that applies to the Jager 7 will probably apply to the uh, Druazina Winter Edition, I, I guess. It's a small gold bar. It acts like a coin, basically. It's a, it's a, it's a coin reskin. This is basically the robot uh, flash device that you get from the Undying Returns elusive target only permanent. And it's suspicious, I think, from what I remember. The Sword of Bartoli 12 gauge is... Oh god, this, this has problems. Right, this is meant to be concealable, and it is. However, if you bring it into the level without the briefcase, it won't be concealed. You'll just have it on you, you'll just be holding it. Welcome to Paris 47. The show is just about to start. This is the red carpet event of the season and the guest list is a veritable who's who of the global fashion elite. You will find Viktor Novikov basking in the spotlight, while Dalia Margolis hosts the heavily guarded auction on the second floor for a group of Iago's top customers. 
Now, event security will keep a watchful eye on any suspicious activity. But I trust your timeless look shall fit right in. Good luck, 47. Drop the shotgun! Right down with extreme... I mean, you can conceal it directly afterwards if you're in a location without any guards, but they will immediately insta-spot you, like in Paris. I'm not sure why this is a thing, please fix it. The New Yorker with gloves is interesting in the fact that it's essentially an elusive target suit for the bank. I'm not sure why you've done that, although considering you're not doing elusive targets for Mumbai, there's a good chance you're not doing them for the bank either. Uh, probably because the bank is very self-contained story-wise and it wouldn't make much sense to do it. I don't know, maybe you have another suit that you're going to do, we'll have to find out because again you change your rules so much that we don't know what you're going to do. Considering you want to use a road map and you have rules in place for what you provide on that road map, it would be nice to know in future. Please let us know. It's a sword. What do you want from me? It's an emetic grenade, but you put it on the ground and then you activate it remotely, as the name would imply, and it makes anyone sick in a fairly small AoE. Aside from that, it's completely fine. Strangely, all these remote devices, they're not under poison. I'm not sure why, but whatever. Ah uh, yes, the Psycho 1, which is essentially a Calmel 1 reskin, which is the sedative gun I mentioned earlier. It, it just makes people sick instead of sedating them. Interestingly enough, if you have the Calmel 1 and the Psycho 1, whichever one you equipped first, it will stack its ammo, so the sedative syringes become vomitoral syringes. That's a bit weird. F please fix that. This is actually kind of an interesting weapon. It is a dagger with a single dose of lethal poison, so you can actually poison people's drinks with it, which is interesting. It's literally a Swiss army knife, it's only got one dose, so uh, bear that in mind. So it's still useful as a, as a dagger if you're in a pinch, I guess. But that's a nice little gimmick of putting poison in the handle. I, I like that, that's kind of cool. It's a suit. It's a, it's a recolor, I think, of the Marrakesh suits, I think. But whatever, it looks fine. It's a bright red arctic toolbox. It, it stands out from a crowd and the design on it is not fantastic looking. Uh, it looks more like an industrial tool case, I guess. But whatever, people will like it, I guess. Not my deal though. Yeah, I have issues with the electrocution phone. It is OP. Very OP, but I'm going to say it, it is pay to win, and it's not even in specific circumstances. You throw it on the ground, or place it on the ground, wait for your target to find it, they put it in their pocket, you remotely activate a ringer, and then they die of electrocution a few seconds later. It's an accident kill, meaning it doesn't count towards bodies found, like the sedative mechanic, and it means... It's a really easy way to off a target. Why was this made? Seriously, re rework this. I'm not sure how you would rework this, but this is stupid. The JK7 Tuatara, which, as I mentioned earlier, with the Druazina 34 ICA Arctic, is... It's fine. It's basically the Seeger 300, except you can pierce more than one body for some strange reason, which is something that was lifted from the Striker from the Game of the Year edition or the El Matador, which is a reskin of the Striker, only gold. And, uh, yeah, it's a slightly worse Seeger 300 in that you have to build it when you take it out of your briefcase. It's fine, but I wouldn't use it, if I'm honest. I still use the Seeger 300 Ghost, which is still the best sniper rifle in the game. I don't even know what this is meant to be, really, aside from a uh, improvised garrot, which I've never used outside of game uh, footage for this uh, video. But that's it. It's a it's a reskinned garrot. And it looks mechanical if you're into that. Another reskinned garrot. In, in this case, some earphones, which you can sort of find reskinned versions of these in the bank and haven, which is strange. I'm not sure why these are premium options, but whatever. Okay, it, at least it looks nice, I guess. It's a dagger that doesn't look like a dagger. I, I'm not sure what you want from me here. It's a snowball. You can bring this with you in any level, even if it's in the hot tropics, which is slightly amusing if a bit, and a bit nami. So, uh, yeah. 
I actually approve of this one because it's a little bit different. Uh, as soon as you hit someone with it, it does uh, does not keep its shape. It does fall apart like uh, the muffins or whatever. So that's interesting. It's a winter sports suit. He doesn't put on the goggles at any point, which is a very big missed opportunity. I'll say this about the smart casual suit. It actually looks different. Yeah, it looks like a hooded variant of the winter coat suit thing from the elusive target missions. I might wear it on occasion because yeah, at least it's different. But aside from that, not my deal. A lot of these suits aren't my deal in case you haven't uh, picked up on that yet. Overall, the weapons are either fine reskins of each other or not really worth buying the expansion pass for. The only one you'd probably buy the expansion pass for is the ICA electrocution phone, which as I pointed out is OP, and there's a good chance they might nerf it. If they don't nerf it, then uh, shame on me, I guess, for wanting a balanced game. I'm one of the few people who played the Hitman 2 Sniper Assassin levels on the semi-regular. I played Himmelstein and Hantu Poor about 20 times each, and I like the maps of them. They are decent puzzles, and the feeling you get for figuring something out is a massive high, only rivaled by snorting Jorge Franco Super Cocaine. The only sniper maps that were added in post-release were Hantu Poor and Siberia, the former set in South Korea and the latter in Siberia, in case the... Uh, name wasn't obvious. Hansu Port is, in my opinion, way easier than Himmelstein. The mechanics for hiding bodies is a bit more obvious. Hiding them in water is easier than in Himmelstein, as more guards are situated near waters and piles of crates. The events that you can do to change the behaviour of your targets are cleverly placed and provide a good amount of assassination opportunities. In fact, the sniper assassin missions have gotten better every time a new one has been released. Siberia is better than Hansu Port, which is better than Himmelstein. The two complaints I have is the grind, which I'll talk about after Siberia, and the second complaint, which applies to all the Sniper Assassin maps, is the music used to the levels, which is straight from Himmelstein, the first one. That's not bad music, I just find it really unfitting. I don't know, maybe I associate it with Himmelstein's grandiose manner versus some boats in a grimy port at night. The music dissonance is a bit weird for me. Siberia did add in a few more tracks when you're not scoped in, but it's otherwise the same piece of music when the action starts. However, while they are all design-wise fantastic, they are very grindy very grindy. The first two levels don't even give you rewards for you to use in the main game, so there's literally no point in playing them, only improving your sniper rifle in a given sniper level. Siberia does give you the sniper rifle from the level to use in the main missions, but again, it's really grindy. Basically, in order to get that sniper rifle, you need to play this map to perfection multiple times, account for bullet drop and swaying, do accident kills, make sure bodies aren't found. It's a hassle. It's why I play them for 20 minutes at a time. Still, they do have replay value, unlocking all accident kills and other easter eggs unlike the special assignments I have mentioned earlier, which have the equivalent replay value of about an hour. No, I won't stop insulting them, by the way. So, that was the season pass. While value for a product is in the eye of the beholder, in my eyes, I think that paying an extra £32.99 is not really worth it. The weapon packs are reskins of already existing items, a winter sports suit, a skiing python, an arctic toolbox, quick draw garrot, two sniper assassin maps, two main missions, four tiny special assignments whose names shall never be mentioned again, a smart casual suit, ICA flash phone, and finally the earphone garrot, all of which is not much content in the grand scheme of things. The special assignments are not worth playing any more than once or twice each, the winter sports suit and smart casual suit are nice, but, you know, their suits, a reskinned bright orange briefcase, two genuinely fun, if repetitive and grindy sniper levels, and finally the bank and resort, the fantastic jewels in the expansion pass that sadly did not make it worth getting on release. It's fine getting it now, now that everything's out, but if you were one of the people who thought that the expansion pass would be a grandiose set of content, well, sorry to disappoint. Ironically, all the free stuff you've released for the game, I've had way more fun with than anything you've released in your season pass, and I am including the levels in that. I regret buying the gold edition. Do better, IOI. I know you can be better. And to everyone thinks I'm entitled after I prattle down on the list of things that were included, you can call me that all you want. But from my understanding, season passes are generally meant to contain substantial content, not reskins of suits, weapons, and maps. Really think about that. And with that, I thank you very much for listening.